Hi, friends. So um, you, you're probably aware by now of the um, incredible um, migrant situation at the border and how Trump is wanting to build the wall and or is building a wall and the yeah. incredible racism that goes along with that. And um, I was just reading today of a young, oh, that how young women in detention centers, young girls, probably around 12 or whatever, unaccompanied in these children detention centers and uh, they, they're basically given one sanitary pad a day and you see these young girls bleeding through their jeans and they're having periods basically and they're not able to shower. They have to ask if they can have a shower. They're not able to get fresh clothes and this would be a terrible thing for young girls to have to go through. Um, and that's sort of commonplace. This is how they treat, you know, this is how they treat. This is the racist kind of uh, things that are done to young young girls and probably um, many of them are from Honduras. So this is in the U.S. detention centers where they have child and they completely abandon the, this Flores Agreement. The Flores, uh, I think it's called the Flores Agreement in 1997, a settlement agreement in Flores versus Reno set national standards for the treatment and placement of minors in what was then Immigration and Naturalization Service in, in INS custody. INS obligations under the agreement are now the responsibility of the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Settlement, ORR. The agreement uh, establishes minimum standards for init initial detention and a policy favoring release of minors. It also requires the children who remain in federal custody to be placed in the best, in the least restrictive environment and mandates provision of information service uh, treatment and services okay well none of that's really happening so they've abandoned that Flores versus um, Reno standard and so young um, you know minors uh, girls are just um, you know and uh, children well you've heard all about it but th that's um, not I'm just giving setting the stage for um, you know that these uh, children are probably a lot of them from Honduras and um, the gray zone project did a an excellent um, uh, Max Blumenthal from the Grey Zone, uh, that this is his uh, sort of project really, um, he did an excellent essay on um, how Joe Biden's privatization plans helped doom Latin America and fuel the migration crisis. So you've probably noticed that um, Joe Biden, despite, you know, these bodgy polls at the DNC, the US Democratic Party seem to be finding to help exclude Tulsi Gabbard uh, from debates. Um, I'm not endorsing Tulsi Gabbard. I'm just saying that, that I think that's very wrong. And I'm going to later on um, in another video talk about what Danny Hapfong, who's written that, helped write that amazing book, The um, American Exceptionalism, American Innocence. Um, he, he talks about how, I mean, it's just appalling doing that to a candidate who happens to be, who says they're anti-war anyway, uh, even though he's not a, a, a supporter of Tulsi Gabbard either. But anyway... Um, so it's looking more and more like uh, they're favoring the DNC is um, finding bodgy polls that support Joe Biden. So it's looking more and more like that's the person they want as their um, primary nominee, you know, to get through the primaries. As you know, they the DNC um, has no problem uh, sort of there's no problem at all um, sort of stealing primaries away from people and um, and and. Um, showing bias to candidates and all of that it's you know it's just just corruption through and through so whoever you know it's looking more and more like whomever they want which it's looking more like joe biden because he's probably the the easiest um you know he's going to do everything that they want uh, that the uh, military industrial com complex wants he's going to do everything it'll be like obama but worse really and um you know, he's very dithery. I don't know. He's, he's not quite all there in some ways. I don't know, really. It just sort of seems like that. Anyway, so Max Blumenthal says how Joe Biden, Biden's privatization plans helped doom Latin America and fuel the immigration crisis. Um, I'm just going to read um, some of this. Uh, I may read all of it because I think it's a really, really important uh, essay and it really gives a great, um, it really gives great, information about how there has been such a huge migration crisis, uh, particularly from Honduras, and how he has, he and Obama, 
uh, really, really helped do that. And of course, um, so, you know, and it's Hillary Clinton. So on the campaign trail, Joe Biden has boasted of his role in transforming Colombia and Central America through ambitious economic and security programs. Colombians and Hondurans tell the gray zone about the damage his plans did to their societies. While campaigning for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination this year, former Senator and Vice President Joe Biden, Joseph Biden has touted the crucial role he played in designing U.S. mega development and drug war campaigns that transformed the socio-political landscape of large swathes of Latin America. Um, and the reason, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to read this is because, you know, it's always, you know, the Democratic Party like to blame everything on Trump as if n- nothing bad was happening before Trump. I mean, it's just sort of a, a common thread that goes through these presidential administrations. It's just a sort of a, a seamless, in some ways, a seamless thread. It's just that Trump happens to be more crass and they don't like him because he's crass and he's not smooth like Obama um, and he's he's a bit and to say he's a little bit unstable and a little bit unpredictable is um, that's sort of a understating it. So um, you know. So anyway, this is just sort of indicates how this immigration crisis is as much the Democratic Party and the 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 presidents that they have at, at, um, leading those party, the presidential nominees or whatever, um, as uh, the Trump administration and prior GOP administration. So, you know, it's just something important that we need to keep in mind. Quote, I was one of the architects of Plan Columbia, end quote, Biden boasted in a July 5th interview with CNN, referring to the multi-billion dollar U.S. effort to end Colombia's civil war with a massive surge of support for the mil- country's military. According to Biden, the plan was a panacea for Colombia's problems from, quote, crooked cops, end quote, to civil strife. But Biden's plan for Colombia has contributed directly to the country's transformation into a hyper-militarized bastion of right-wing rule, enhancing the power and presence of the notoriously brutal armed forces while failing miserably in its anti-narcotic and reformist objectives. The year, this year alone, more than 50 human rights defenders were killed in Colombia in the first four months of 2019, while coca production is close to record levels. And as Colombian peace activists lamented in interviews with the Grey Zone, the U.S. is still in complete control of Bogota's failed anti-drug policy, thanks largely, largely to Plan Colombia. Biden has also pumped up his role in an initiative called the Alliance for Prosperity, which has applied to which was applied to the Northern Triangle of Central America. The former vice president was so central to the program's genius, a uh, genesis, that it was informally known as Plan Biden. Quote Plan Biden. End quote. It's just, it's just amazing. I just find it amazing. The U.S. meddling is just goes on unabated, and they're like a cancer. You know, it really is. Marketed as an answer to the crisis of child migration. Biden's brainchild channeled $750 million through a right-wing government installed by a U.S.-orchestrated military coup to spur mega-development projects and privatize social services. The Grey Zone visited Honduras in July and documented, through interviews with human rights defenders, students, indigenous activists, and citizens from all walks of life, how the Alliance for Prosperity helped set the stage for a national rebellion. In recent months, teachers, doctors, students and rural camp- campesinos have been in, in the streets protesting the privatization plans imposed on their country under the watch of Biden and his successors. The gutting of public health services, teacher layoffs, staggering hikes in electricity prices and environmentally destructive mega-development projects are critical factors in the mass migration from Honduras. And indeed, they are immediate byproducts of the so-called, quote, Biden plan, end quote. By, quote, Biden is taking credit for doing something constructive to stop the migration crisis and blaming the concentration camps on the U.S.-Mexico border on Trump. But it's Biden's policies that are driving more people out of Central America and making human rights defenders' lives more precarious by defending entities that have no interest in human rights, end quote, explained Adrian Pine, a professor of anthropology at American University and leading researcher of the social crisis in Honduras 
in an interview with the Grey Zone. Quote, so 750 million taxpayer dollars that were allocated to supposedly address child migration. Now, I'm just going to stop for a moment. Unfortunately, a lot of, um, a lot of left-wing and right-wing, of course, left-wing um, publications, um, unfortunately, don't really understand how the sovereign economy works. And, um, and so I, I urge you to learn MMT. That's the hashtag, learn MMT, to find out what's wrong with that sentence, 750 million U.S. taxpayer dollars. Federal taxes do not fund spending. It's a sovereign economy, and and so we have to stop saying that. We have to stop saying that um, taxpayers' money is funding these various things. They just aren't. Taxes are important, but not for the reasons we think they are, and that's why we need to understand how a sovereign economy works so we don't put out that kind of economically illiterate stuff. So I'm going to co- continue on, but anyway. So, quote, so $750 million U.S. taxpayer dollars that were allocated to supposedly address child migration are actually making things worse, end quote. Pine added, quote, it started with unaccompanied minors and now you have children in cages, largely thanks to Biden, end quote. In an interview with CNN on July 5th, Biden was asked if he favored decriminalizing the entry of Latin American migrants to the United States. Responding with a definitive no, Biden stated that he would be, quote, surging folks to the border to make those concrete decisions, end quote, about who receives asylum. Biden argued that he had the best record of addressing the root causes of migration, of the migration crisis, recalling how he imposed a solution on Central America's migration crisis, quote, you do the following things to make your country better so people don't leave, and we will help you do that just like we did in Colombia, end quote, he said. I mean, this sort of that sort of statement must just drive these people, you know, just just make them so angry because that is such a lie. It's just all propaganda. Uh, Any time the U.S. is involved in so-called humanitarian um, stuff in the in whatever country, they've usually caused that humanitarian crisis, and um, they have they're not going to try and fix it. That's not what they do. They go in and they meddle. They overthrow democratically elected governments and then they bring in their uh, corporations and they steal the resources of that country and they do that again and again and again and again and again. Just have a look at how many they how many countries they um, governments they've overthrown since 1946. That must drive um, people in the Latin American countries just crazy when they hear that. Quote, what did we do in Colombia? We went down and said, okay, I was one of the architects of Plan Columbia, end quote. Biden continued. I said, quote, I said, here's the deal. If you have all these crooked cops, all these federal police, we're sending our FBI down. You let us put them through a lie detector test. Let us tell you who you should fire and tell you the kind of people you should hire. They did and began to change. We can do so much if we were committed, end quote. I mean, this is amazing, this idea that the U.S. Can, is, is somehow can dictate to all these countries what they should be doing. And they just go and plant themselves there. They don't ask for anybody's permission and they help install, you know, dictators and, um, and puppets into these places um, through corrupt means. And then they manipulate them to do whatever they want. They don't even have to manipulate them in Honduras. Uh, anyway, so um, it's just really, really, really sad. And the arrogance, you know, this this arrogance, the American exceptionalism arrogance. That's why do check out Danny Hapfong's and I think it's David Servant's book, um, American Exceptionalism and American Innocence. It's really, it's really, I'm enjoying it. I haven't finished it. I've only really just started it, but it's it, so far it's it's really, really, it's an important book. With the arrogance of a pith helmet, helmeted high colonial official meting out instructions on who to hire and fire to his docile subjects, Biden presided over a plan that failed miserably in its stated goals while transforming Colombia into a hyper-militarized bastion of U.S. regional influence. Plan Colombia was originally conceived by Colombian President Andres Pastrana in 1999 as an alternative development and conflict resolution plan for his war-torn country. He considered calling it the, quote, plan for Colombia's peace, end quote. The proposal was quickly hijacked by the Bill 
by the Bill Clinton administration, with Joe Biden lobbying in the Senate for an iron-fisted militarization plan. Quote, We have an obligation in the interests of our children and the interests of the hemisphere to keep the oldest democracy in place, to give them a fighting chance to keep from becoming a, a narco state, end quote, Biden said in, June 2000 floor, in a June 2000 floor speech. When Plan Colombia's first formal draft was published, it was done so in English, not Spanish. The original spirit of peace building was completely sapped from the document by Biden, whose vigorous wheeling and dealing ensured that almost 80% of the $7.5 billion plan went to the Colombian military. 500 U.S. military personnel were promptly dispatched to Bogota to train the, the country's military. If you read the original Plan Colombia, not the one that was written in Washington, but the original Plan Colombia, there's no mention of military drives against FARC rebels, end quote. Robert White, the former number two at the U.S. Embassy in Bogota, complained in 2000. Quote, quite the con contrary, Pastrana says the FARC is part of the history of Colombia and a historical phenomenon, he says and they must be treated as Colombians, end quote. White lamented how Washington had, has abused the trust of the Colombians. Quote, they come and ask for bread and you give them stones, end quote. Plan Colombia was largely implemented under the watch of the hard, hardline right-wing president, Avaro Uribe. I'm sorry if I mispronounce that. In 1991, Uribe was pla placed on a U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency list of, quote, important Colombian narco-traffickers, end quote, in part due to his role in keeping drug kingpin Pablo Escobar's obtained licenses for, for landing strips, while Uribe was the head of Colombia's Civil Aeronautics Department. Under Uribe's watch, toxic chemicals were sprayed by military forces across the Colombian countryside, poisoning the crops and impoverished farmers and displacing millions. Six years under Bill Clinton initiated Plan Colombia, however, even U.S. drug czar John Waters, Walters was forced to quietly admit in a letter to the Senate that the price of cocaine in the U.S. has declined, the flow of the drug into the U.S. has risen, and its purity has increased. Meanwhile, a UN, drug of, a UN Office of Drugs and Crime report found the cocoa, cul cocoa cultivation reach record levels in Colombia in 2018. In other words, billions of dollars have been squandered and a society already in turmoil has been laid to waste. For the military and right-wing par par paramilitary forces that have shored up the rule of leaders like Uribe and the current ultra-conservative Colombian President Ivan Duque, uh, Plan Colombia offered a sense of near-total impunity. The depravity of the country's military was put on hold on bold display when the so-called false positive scandal was exposed in 2008. The incident began when army officers lured 22 rural laborers to a faraway location, massacred them, and then dressed them in uniforms of the leftist FARC guerrillas. It was an overt attempt to raise the FARC body count and justify the counterinsurgency aid flowing from the US under Plan Colombia. The officers who oversaw the slaughter were paid bounties and given promotions. Colombian academics Omar Eduardo Rojas Bolanos and Fabian Leonardo Benavides, sorry if I'm mispronouncing these names, I'm sorry, demonstrated in a meticulous study that the, quote, false positives, end quote, killings reflected, quote, a systemic practice that implicates the com commanders of brigades, battalions, and tactical units, end quote, in the deaths of more than 10,000 civilians. Indeed, under Plan Colombia, the incident was far from an isolated atrocity. In an interview in Bogota this May, the Grey Zone's Ben Norton asked Colombian social leader Santiago Salinas if there was any hope for progressive political transformation since the ratification of Plan Colombia. An organiser of the peace group Congreso de los Pueblos, I'm sorry, I'm probably massacring these names, Salinas shrugged and exclaimed, Quote, I wish, end quote. He lamented that many of Colombia's most pivotal decisions were made in Washington. Salinas pointed to the drug policy as an example. Quote, it seems the drug decisions about what to do with the drugs, it has nothing to do with Colombia. There was no sovereign decision on the issue. Colombia does not have a decision, end quote, he continued. 
it was the Washington that it was the Washington that wrote the script for Bogota. And the drug trade is in fact a key part of the global financing financial system, Salinas pointed out. But Biden was not finished. After 15 years of human misery and billions of uh, wasted dollars in Colombia, he set out on a personal mission to export his pet program to Central America, to Central America's crime and corruption ravaged Northern Triangle. In his July sit-down with CNN, Joe Biden trumpeted his plan Colombia as the inspiration for the Alliance for Prosperity imposed on Social America. Channeling the spirit of colonial times once again, he bragged of imposing Washington's policies on the governments of El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras. Quote, we make a deal with you, end quote, we'll make a deal with you, end quote, Biden recalled. Telling the leaders of these countries, you do the following things to make your country better so people don't leave and we'll help you do that, end quote. <sighs> Biden announced his bold plan on the editorial pages of the New York Times in January 2015. He called it a, quote, joint plan for the economic and political reforms an alliance for prosperity, end quote. Sold by the vice president as a panacea to a worsening migration crisis, the Alliance for Prosperity was a boon for the international financial institutions, which promised to deepen the economic grief of the region's poor. The Alliance for Prosperity, quote, treated the Honduran government as if it were a crystal clear, pure vessel into which gold could be poured and prosperity would flow outward, end quote, explained Donna Frank, a professor of history at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the author of the book, The Long Honduran Night. Quote, in reality, the plan would rather would further enrich and strengthen the political power of the very same elites whose green, deliberate subversion of the rule of law and the destruction of natural resources and of indigenous and campesino land rights were responsible for the dire conditions the proposal ostensibly addressed, end quote, Frank added. In Honduras, the government had no capacity or will or will to resist Biden's plan. That is because the country's elect, elected president, Juan Manuel Zelaya, has been removed, had been removed in 2009 in a coup orchestrated by the United States. As Zelaya told the Grey Zone's annual power pill, and you can check out that video the, on the Grey Zone uh, on YouTube, the Grey Zone Project, the Obama administration was infuriated by his participation in ALBA, A-L-B-A, a regional economic development program put forward by Venezuela's then-president, Hugo Chavez, that provided an alternative to neoliberal formulas like the so-called, quote, Biden plan, end quote. Following, following the military coup, a corporate-friendly administration was installed to advance the interests of international financial institutions, and the U.S. trainers arrived in town to hone the new re mechanisms of re repression. Under the auspices of the Central American Regional Security Initiative, the FBI was dispatched to oversee the training of FUSINA, F-U-S-I-N-A, the main operational arm of the Honduran Army and the base of the Military Police for Public Order, PMOP, that patrols cities like an occupation force. In an October 2014 cable, um, and he, he's got the cable here in this article, so check it out, the U.S. Emb Embassy in, in Tegucigalpa, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, acknowledged that the PMOP it says, was riven with corruption and prone to abuse and attempted to distance itself from the outfit, even though it operated under, under the umbrella of Fusina. This June, the PMOP invaded the autonomous University of Honduras, attacking students, protesting the privatization of their school and wounding six. The creation of the U.S. Embassy in Honduras of, of a special forces unit known as the Tigris has added an additional layer of repressive muscle. Besides arresting activists, the Tigris reportedly helped a drug king, kingpin escape after he was detained during a U.S. investigation. While violent crime surged across Honduras, unemployment more than doubled, extreme poverty surged, and so too did the government's security spending. To beef up his military, President Juan Orlando Hernandez dipped into the social programs that kept a mostly poor population from tumbling into destitution. As Alex, Rubin, as Alex Rubenstein reported for the Grey Zone, the instability of post-coup Honduras has been particularly harsh on LGTTBI, that's lesbian, gay, trans, travesti, uh, bisexual and intersex Hondurans. 
More than 300 of them have been killed since 2009, a dramatic spike in hate crimes reinforced by the homophobic rhetoric of the right-wing evangelical confraternity that represents the civil society wing of the ultra-conservative Hernandez government. As the social chaos enveloped Honduran society, migration to the U.S. border. Now, this is a a, a very good spiel here, and it shows Obama and Biden's um, complicity in this um, crisis, which Trump is just continuing on and worsening, basically. As the social chaos enveloped Honduran society, migration to the U.S.-Mexico border began to surge at two catastrophic levels. Oh, and I invite you to also check out um, the Empire Files program on... um, um, no more deaths, and uh, they 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 go around with the group No More Deaths and show how the migrants are being funneled through these areas that are incredibly inhospitable, and the ICE um, border security go around and tip out water left by the group No More Deaths. They leave these huge amounts of you know these gallons and gallons and gallons of water for these migrants who are traveling across these funneled areas that are just so inhospitable. And many, many die on these trips, and um, um, and they've been the I, you, they have video of ice guards just tipping the water out or putting something in them and sort of putting these cross skulls and skull bones and crosses on them, basically saying if you drink this, you know, water, um, something bad will happen to you. And um, you know, it's just disgusting. It's really, really disgusting. And even one of the people from No More Deaths uh, who actually. Um, gave aid to a couple of migrants um he was they tried to prosecute him and i think it was make it a felony even he managed i think so far he's managed to avoid being imprisoned for it um but that's that's the sort of attitude you know towards these people that are are, are fleeing u.s meddling basically and the destruction of their countries by the u.s and this is how they're treated they're then having to cross rivers like that father and child who drowned in the river or, or you know, people just dying, going in, insane with um, thirst and, and, and a heat stroke and, and just dying in, the, in, in these, you know, in these terrible expanses of um, nothingness, hot nothingness. It, you know, it's just, anyway, check out that No More De- Deaths that the Empire Files did. Um, it's really, really a great insight into the appallingness of the U.S. domestic policy policies towards um, and what ICE does. Unable to make ends meet, some Hondurans sent their children alone to the border, hoping, hoping that they would receive temporary protective or refugee status. By 2014, the blowback of the Obama administration's coup had caused a national emergency. Thousands of Hondurans were winding up in cages in detention camps run by the Department of Homeland Security. And I'll just show you this quick um, uh, image from Abby Martin's Twitter that I saw today about those young girls just being ele- left to bleed into, into their clothes. They had their periods and not given any sort of assistance. Um, so anyway, um, by the U.S. Home- Department of Homeland Security, and many of them were not even 16 years old. The summer, Obama went to Congress for, I mean, the, the by the way, the um, in, the I'm not sure what they were like during the Obama administration with young girls bleeding, um, having their periods. But anyway, that's what's happening now. That Obama, this that summer, Obama went to Congress for. That summer, Obama went to Congress for 3.7 billion in emergency funds to ramp up border militarization and deport as many unaccompanied Central American miners as possible. Biden used the opportunity to rustle up an additional billion dollars exploiting the crisis to fund a massive neoliberal project that saw Honduras as a base for international financial opportunity. His plan was quickly ratified and the first phase of the Alliance for Prosperity began. Don't you love that name, Alliance for Prosperity? The implementation of the Alliance for Prosperity was overseen by the Inter-American Development Bank, IADB, a U.S.-dominated international financial institution based in Washington, D.C., sorry, Washington, D.C., that supports corporate investments in Latin America and the Caribbean. A graphic on the IADB's website outlined the plan's objectives in anodyne language that concealed its aggressively neoliberal agenda. For instance, the IADB promised the, quote, fostering of regional energy integration, end quote. That was clear a clear reference to Plan Pueblo Panama, 
a regional-wide neoliberal development blueprint that was conceived as a boon to the energy industry. Under the plan, the IADB would raise money from Latin American taxpayers to pay for the expansion of power lines that would carry electricity from Mexico all the way to Panama. Honduras, with its rivers and natural resources, provided the project with major, a major hub of energy production in order for the country's energy to be traded and transmitted to other countries. However, the International Monetary Fund mandated its national electricity company to be privatized. Since the implementation of that component of, quote, Plan Biden, end quote, energy costs have begun to surge for residential Honduran consumers. In a country with 66% poverty rate, electricity privatization has turned life from precarious to practically impossible. Rather than languish in darkness for long hours with unpaid bills piling up, many desperate citizens have journeyed north towards the U.S. border. As intended, the Alliance for Prosperity's regional energy integration plan has spurred an influx of multinational energy companies to Honduras. Hydroelectric dams and power plants began rising up in the midst of lush pine forests and winding rivers that define the Honduran biosphere, pushing many rural indigenous communities into a life and death struggle. This July, the Grey Zone travelled to Retoka, Retoka, a remote farming community located in the heart of the Honduran dry sector. The indigenous Lenka residents of this town depend on their local river for fish, recreation and, mostly, and most importantly, water to irrigate the crops that provide them with a livelihood. But the, uh, the rush on energy investment brought an Italian-Chilean firm called Progelsa to the area to build a massive hydroelectric dam just upstream. Wilma Alonso, a member of the Lenka Indigenous Council of Ritoka, spoke with Grey Zone, the Grey Zone, shaking with emotion as he described the consequences of the dam for his community. Quote, the entire village is involved in this struggle, end quote, Alonso said. Quote, everyone knows the catastrophe that the construction of this hydroelectric plant would create, end quote. He explained that, like so many foreign multinationals in Honduras, Progelser employs an army of private thugs to intimidate protesters. Quote, the private company uses the army and the police to repress us. They accuse of us of being trespassers, but they are the ones trespassing on our land. End quote. The Alliance for Progress also provided the backdrop for the assassination of the renowned Honduran environmentalist, feminist organizer Berta Caceres. On March 3, 2016, Caceres was gunned down in her home in rural Honduras. A towering figure in her community with a presence on the international stage, Caceres has been leading the fight against the local dam project, overseen by DESA, D-E-S-A, a powerful Honduran energy company backed by the United States Agency for International Development, the USAID, and run by powerful former military officers. The representative that DESA sent to sign its deal with USAID, Sergio Rodriguez, was later accused of masterminding Caceres' murder, alongside military officials and former company employees. In in March 2018, the Honduras police arrested DESA's executive president, Roberto David Castillo Major, or Major, sorry, Uh, sorry about these massacring of these uh, names, accusing him of, quote, providing logistics and other resources to one of the material authors, end quote, of the assassination. Castillo was a West Point graduate who worked in the energy industry while serving as a Honduran intelligence officer. This July, the Grey Zone visited the family of Berta Caceres in La Esperanza, a town nestled in the verdant mountains of Iti in in Tibuca. Caceres' mother, Dona Dona Berta lives there under 24-hour police guard paid for by human rights groups. The Caceres household is bristling with security cameras and family members get around in armoured cars. In her living room, we met Laura Zuniga Caceres of the Civil Council of Indigenous and Popular Organisations of Honduras, that's the C-O-P-I-N-H, the human rights group that her mother, Berta, founded. Quote, the violence in Honduras generate, generates migrant caravans with which tears apart society and it, ha, it all has to do with all of this extract, extractivism, this violence, end quote, Zuniga Caceres told the Grey Zone. Quote, and the response from the U.S. government is to send more soldiers to our land. It is to reinforce one of the factors that generates the violence that most, uh, generates violence the most in our society, end quote. 
quote, we are receiving reports from our comrades that there is a U.S. military presence in indigenous Lanka territory, end quote, she added. For what? Humanitarian aid? With weapons? It's violence. It's persecution, end quote, she said. The Alliance for Prosperity also commissioned the privatization of health services through a deceptively named pro- program called Social Protection Framework Work Law, or L- La Ley Marco de Protección Social. Now, I, I don't speak Spanish or so anyway, um, or Portuguese, I'm not sure. So that just shows how much I understand. So, so anyway, promoted by Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez as a needed reform, the scheme was advanced through a classic shock doctrine style episode. In 2015, close associates of Hernandez siphoned some $300 million from the Honduran Institute of Social Services, the IHSS, into private businesses, starving hospitals of supplies and causing several thousand excess deaths, mostly among the poor. With the medical sector in shambles, Hondurans were were then forced to seek health care from the private companies that were to provide services under Hernandez, quote, social protection, end quote, plan. Quote, the money that was robbed from, the money that was robbed in the IHSS scandal was used to justify the Lemarco Protection Social, end quote, Karen Spring, a researcher and coordinator for the Honduras Solidarity Network, told the Grey Zone, quote, the hospitals, with no, the hospitals were left in horrible conditions with no human capital and they were left to farm out to private hospitals. Quote, when Hondurans go to hospitals, they will be told they need to go to a private company and through the deductions in their jobs, they will have to pay a lot out of their pocket. Spring said, quote, through the old universal system, you would be covered no matter what you had from a broken arm to cancer, no more, end quote. In response, Hondurans poured out into the streets, launching the March of Tortures, the first major wave of continuous protests against Hernandez and his corrupt administration. In March 2015, in the middle of the crisis, Joe Biden rushed down to Guatemala City to embrace Hernandez and restore confidence in the Alliance for Prosperity. I come, quote, I come from a state that, in fact, is the corporate capital of America, more corporations are headquartered there than any place else, end quote, Biden boasted, with Hernandez and the presidents of Guatemala and El Salvador standing by his side, quote, they want to come here, corporate America wants to come, end quote. Emphasizing the need for more anti-corruption and security measures to attract international financial investment, Biden pointed to Plan Colombia as a shining model and to himself as its architect, quote, Today, Colombia is a nation transformed, just as you hope to be 10 to 15 years from now, end quote. The vice president proclaimed, what a nightmare. What a nightmare he is. If anybody thinks they're ever going to get um, Medicare for all under Biden, dream on. I mean, he he's made it pretty clear that he, he he's not going to do that. And I really think he's going to end up being the U.S., um, the Democratic Party's presidential pick, the nominee. Um, all these bodgy polls are like, like I thought it was going to be Kamala Harris, and it may still well be, but she's like half, um, getting half as much in percentage points in these bodgy polls by the um, that are shown by the U.S. Democratic Party than Biden is. He's sort of way ahead, which I don't believe at all. Um, anyway, but there you go. That's that's U.S. corruption in politics and the electoral corruption. It's just ast- astonishing, really. If anybody needs a overseers in elections, um, you know, the U.S. is always going on about Venezuela, who, who have the most transparent elections in the world, despite when, what they were carrying on about. If anybody needs any overseeing in elections, it's the U.S. Okay. Um, following Biden's visit, the privatization of the Honduran economy continued apace, and so did the corruption, the repression, and the unflinching support from Washington. In 2017, the movement in Honduras that had galvanized against the U.S.-orchestrated 2009 coup saw its most immediate opportunity for political transformation at the ballot box. President Hernandez was running for re-election, violating a constitutional provision on term limits. His opponent, Salvador Nasrallah, was a popular broadcast personality who provided a centrist consensus choice for the varied elements that opposed the country's coup regime. When voting ended in November 26, Nasrallah's victory appeared certain, with exit polls showing him comfortably ahead by several points. But suddenly the government announced that a power outage required the suspension of vote vote counting. 
Days later, Hernandez was declared the victor by about 1%. The fraud was so transparent that the Organization uh, of American States, OAS, normally an arm of U.S. interests in Latin America, declared in a preliminary, preliminary report that, quote, errors, irregularities, and systemic problems, end quote, as well as, quote, extreme statistical improbability, end quote, rendered the election invalid. But the United States recognized the results anyway, leaving disenfranchised Hondurans with protest as their only recourse. Quote, Hondurans tried to change what happened in the country through the 2017 elections, not just Hernandez, but all the implementation of all these policies that the Biden plan had funded and implemented all these years since the coup, end quote, explained Karen Spring of the Honduras Solidarity Network. Quote, they tried to change the reality through votes, and when the elections turned out to be fraud, tons of people had no choice but to take to the streets, end quote. In the front lines of the protests in 2017 was Spring's longtime partner, the Honduran activist Edwin Espinal. Espinal, um, following a protest in November of that year where poverty damage took place, Espinal was arrested in November of that year where property damage uh, took place. Espinal was arrested at gunpoint at his home and accused of setting fire to the front door of the hotel. He fervently denied all charges, accused the government, accusing the government of persecuting him for, politi- for his political activism. In fact, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights had placed a protective measure on Espinal in 2010 in response to previous attempts to legally railroad him. The government placed Espinal in pretrial detention in La Tolva, a U.S.-style maximum security prison normally reserved for violent criminals and narco-traffickers. Last October, Espinal and Spring were married in the, in the jail while, while surrounded by masked guards. Since the Biden plan, quote, since the Biden plan, contractors have been coming down to build their, these U.S. style maximum security prisons, end quote, Spring said. Quote, that's where my husband Edwin Espinal is being held, end quote. Quote, they say the company is Honduran, but there's no way Hondurans could have built that without U.S. architects or U.S. construction firms giving them the plans, end quote, she added. Quote, I've been in the prison and it's like they dumped a U.S. prison in the middle of Honduras, end quote. Reflecting on her husband's persecution, Spring explained, quote, Edwin wanted to stay in his country to change the reality that caused mass migration. He's one of the people who's faced consequences because he went to the streets and he's faced persecution for years because he's one of the Hondurans who wanted to change the, the country by staying and fighting. Berta Caceres was another, end quote. Quote, Hondurans wanted to use their votes to change the country and now they're voting with their feet, end quote, she continued. Quote, so if Biden's plan really addressed the root causes of the migrant crisis, why aren't people asking why migration is getting worse? Hondurans are voting on the Biden plan by fleeing and saying, your plan didn't work and it made our situation worse by fleeing to the border, end quote. So that's um, the excellent essay, essay by Max Blumenthal, who's an award-winning journalist and the author of several books, including best-selling Republican Gomorra, Goliath, The 51-Day War, the Management of Savagery. The Management of Savage, Savagery um, is a very, very good book, and all these other books are great. Noam Chomsky says Goliath is, amazing, is, a, is an incredible book. Uh, Max has produced print articles for an array of publications, many video reports, and several documentaries, including Killing, Killing Gaza. I interviewed Max um, uh, about Killing Gaza, he and Dan Cohen. You can find that on Faint Signals from Vigo, my channel. Um, I did that about a year and a half ago, when they rele- just before they released that film. That's a really great one. And if you also are interested in that issue, and I hope you are, please check out Abby Martin's wonderful um, film, doco film called um, Freedom, uh, Gaza Fights for Freedom. It's a really great. And you can find that on Vimeo, streaming on Vimeo. So um, Blumenthal founded The Grey Zone in 2015 to shine a journalistic light on America's state of perpetual war and its dangerous, dangerous domestic repercussions. So you can find this at thegreyzone.com. That's G-R-A-Y-Z-O-N-E dot com. Okay, I wanted to read. Uh, I wanted to read all of that because um, uh, I, I just think it's a really excellent uh, background to this migrant crisis, and it also shows very vividly the American meddling, the U.S. meddling, as usual in um, in Honduras, and how that has fueled this migrant crisis, and um, how it's pretty much destroying destroying Honduras and. Um, and of course, you know, Colombia. So um, anyway, uh, that, that's all I really wanted to um, to present. And um, 
and I hope that you will check out the Grey Zone project. Um, it's on YouTube and they have fantastic. Max went down to uh, Honduras and was standing outside the huge U.S. air base they have there. The U it's a huge U.S. base, basically, and it stretches way to the foot of the mountains. That's a really great report, so check that out. He talks about that, that U.S. base and how it's been there. It's just massive. It's a massive base in Honduras. Okay, well, thanks so much for watching. Please subscribe if you like the content. Please click the notifications bell, otherwise you don't receive um, notifications when I drop a video. Uh, my name is Trish Roberts. You're watching Faint Signals for Vega. Thanks for watching. Till next time. Bye for now.